Okay, then, uh, yeah, let's start. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Felix Pogini. I am, as you can see, from Evosoft. Evosoft is a uh, 100% subsidiary of Siemens, and we are quite into the web of things, and that is what I want to introduce to you today. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and hopefully, I can give you an insight into what web of things is and what it is for. Um, yeah. Let's see. Okay, so let's start. If it works. It works. Okay, so what situ uh, situation are we facing at the moment? Normally, if we try to build an application, we are faced with uh, quite some applications. I would assume a lot of you are familiar with a lot of protocols out there and a lot of fragmented in the IoT space. There, um, I, I see it at least that every domain has its own protocol, so to say. Um, if we have a look at the building, it's normally BACnet. If we have a look at the production sites, it's normally OPC or A. But we can imagine that we want to build applications on top of a lot of these uh, sensors or actuators. And so we would have to integrate all of these data sources if we build applications. And so what happened in the past was everybody that was building an application was um, integrating this data on his, uh, on his or her own. He was yeah, like downloading a driver from the internet for that certain protocol to integrate the data into his or her application. And so every application was doing kind of the same thing. They were all trying to integrate the data that is um, available into their application and create their own understanding. Often with shifting from one protocol to the other, so to say if, if um, it was uh, a production application, they tried to translate a bucket protocol to OPC way and create a mapping or the other way around, um, or even uh, on other protocols like, I think the most, um, known example is translating not was into a different protocol because it's twice. Uh, hard to shift bytes and bits at least most of the time. So um, that's quite a common use case. But what does the Web of Things now help you if you want to do something like this? So the Web of Things set out to uh, yeah, counter this fragmentation that is out there, but still we have this fragmentation. And what they try to do is create a small waste approach, so, so to say. They want to try and build an application, uh, an abstraction layer on top of all these protocols. Um, as you can see here, they are trying to build an abstraction layer that is really based on what we see right now and what we see today with um, creating an interface description, the so-called thing description. We'll get into detail what this is a bit later, but we can see it already here on the picture. Um, where they try to create uh, the abstraction of what is out there and make it understandable. So. Um, that is the, the whole plan of the web of things. What are the key aspects if you try to, to create such a, I would say it's an IoT model or even a model of um, the interfaces that we see out there? Normally, you would have to describe the device interface. We already said we have different protocols out there that are trying to describe different interfaces, different protocols, different um, data types, different semantics, and so on. But that's not the only thing. We do not only want to describe objects of the data, we also want to describe uh, the topology of the data. So to say, if we are in a building, we want to know where is the sensor placed? Is it even connected to something else? Let's say we want to know, is the light switch connected to the lamp in the room, or is it even connected to the lamp in the next room? I think everybody of you knows that the light switch for the bathroom often is outside of the bathroom, and that would be quite nice to know if we want to make it smart or something. And then there is uh, even the third part, which are the semantics of a device. Um, this is not only understanding uh, what unit is the data available in. If you have a temperature sensor, there's even degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit, um, or Kelvin. Um, but also to understand. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, to understand 
yeah, what what is all of this data about? Is it is there a minimum? Is there a maximum? Is there a threshold? And um, normally, we as a human are quite good in understanding this implicit knowledge. If we see a temperature sensor and we are in Europe, we know that normally it could be degrees Celsius. And if we see it is a room temperature sensor, we would assume it's between like 16 degrees and maybe 28 degrees. If yeah, the room is not heated or cooled or whatever. Uh, but it could be also a temperature sensor that's maybe uh, in a high machine application that is um, yeah generating power or something. And this is something we want to understand. So now, now I, I did not send you anything new. I think everybody of you knows that we need this understanding and we need to use that. We make we have to make it machine understandable that we want to make or build applications on top of them. But the level of things. Yeah. Is it the only one that is out there? If all of us have that, do the other ones also have the idea? And I would say this idea has existed for quite a long time. And there are big players out there that it's kind of the same thing. You can see some of them here on the slide, and they all have the same understanding or try to evolve their own system and try to create their own understanding of the data. Um, there is, for example, the digital the twin definition language, which tries to uh, describe it as telemetry, state, and command. There is the AWS, which is um, understanding a device as events, states, and actions. But you see, there is a parallel. Um, yeah, they are kind of comparable, these, these understandings of the data. But all of them are kind of proprietary to uh, yeah, the inventor of this so to say language okay now we understand we have a problem there are solutions out there and okay I, i'm yeah the connection is a bit breaking but i'll try to keep it up um so what is the web of things all about i told you there is the thing description out there that is trying to to be also a data model and is invented by the w3c that set up this uh, Web of Things standard, and that is comparable to all of the data models that you see out here. So let's have a look into this thing description, what it is all about. The goal of the thing description is to have a unified format, which describes um, yeah, the, the IoT interface, so to say. I told you we have an interface that derives with, with different protocols and so on. And um, since we need a comparison to a description that is already out there, I normally pick quite a common one, which is in that case Open API. It describes HTTP interfaces. Um, and yeah, and sets out to, to describe this in a formal way, which is understandable by machines and even by different programming languages. And um, the thing description is in that kind of comparable because if we have a look at that, we have kind of the same blocks out there. Um, the difference is mostly that the thing description can describe different protocols, cannot only describe one protocol, because in the case of an API, it's only HTTP, it can describe different protocols. And it can be enhanced with, um, so to say, domain vocabulary in that case, um, which is domain specific. I told you we are um, also talking about different domains, building, production, um, mining, and so on. And we can even attach critical units and, um, uh, yeah, with that, understand the data a lot better. Um, so we see right now here, um, I told you we have these three parts that try to describe a device in all of the data models that we have out there. And the three main parts of the thing descriptions are the properties, actions, and events that try to describe um, a device interface in a formal way. Um, and if you think about what is a property and action in the event, I normally take the example of a lamp. And um, if we talk about a property, it's normally something that you can uh, read or write from that device. So to say, if we talk about a lamp, we want to know, is the lamp switched on? The answer could be yes or no. Or we can also say switch the light on. 
which is then would be a right property um, or even set in this state of the device. Then we have the so-called actions, um, which are, yeah, can be even mixed up, I think, uh, with this right property, but that's um, not part of this talk. Um, yeah, so this, these are actions that we can do on a device. If we keep with the example of a lamp, we can switch the lamp on or off, um, which would be a toggle action in that case, because if we call the toggle action, it doesn't care if the state is on or off, it just toggles to the different state. And last but not least, there are the events which are, uh, yeah, um, describing if the interface is capable of. Uh, giving you any events that are out there, you could talk about alarms if uh, 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 a certain threshold is broken or something. Okay, but let's not dive too deep into the thing description. I think you all understood what it is good for. One last step I want to show you is um, that we this thing description is a JSON document, or in that case, a JSON ID document, so linked data. And it's um, yeah, I hope it's readable. Um, the good thing is it's not only machine readable because it's um, yeah specified, and uh, but but it's also human readable. So if we have to look at this example, and um, we have all of the data that we need to talk to the device uh, written in the stationary, and now if we want to do something on that device, we can even say. On the brightness property, invoke the read property operation because we have specified operations in this thing description. The important part right now is we know what we want to do. We want to read the brightness of the property, but we don't know how. And there comes this forms part in, which says that uh, um, read it from the href. Ah, no, let's read the sentence out completely. On the brightness property, invoke the read property operation by sending an integer value to a co op address at href using the C4 encoding. So, everything that we need to do in, in that case is um, specified in the document, and a program that could be, would be talking to that device can um, use the document to really do the operation that is needed to uh, get it. Okay, now. Let's say we are living in a perfect world and everybody is using thing, thing descriptions and is creating thing descriptions, but a thing description alone does not help anybody, does it? You have just have a JSON LD document flying around somewhere and nobody's interpreting it. So I would say you need um, something that is, yeah, also kind of comparable against to what um, we have in the web world out there already. Um, if we are talking about HTML documents, an HTML document is not really human readable, at least not for me, but that's maybe my problem. We, we have browsers out there that are interpreting an HTML document and displaying it for us. And in that sense, it doesn't matter um, if, if we are using Firefox, Safari, Chrome, whatever, the HTML is specified and it's like representing what is defined in there for us um, in a, yeah, I would say a standard way. And so in the web of things world, we need something that is also interpreting these thing descriptions in order to talk to the devices to maybe make it easier. Um, I would say uh, I'm, I'm simplifying it a bit here, but um, the important part is we need something like a what agent uh, that is capable of talking different protocols, so to say. Um, and we feed these, th this thing description into a what agent in order to talk to a device. It could be also kind of a gateway because it could be, or, or it could abstract these protocols away from us and create, yeah, another um, um, a more formalist way of accessing the data. But the important part is we need some kind of runtime in that case to, to interpret the thing description. Um, there is also one block out there that is also specified by the W3C um, that is called scripting API, which uh, formalizes the functions that you can do on a thing description. Um, 
Yeah, so now I've talked about the problem, what is the solution? Maybe you're asking yourself, this isn't something new, is it? Is somebody already using that? And the answer is, at least within Siemens, a yes. <laughs> um, there are some applications that I want to show you that you may be familiar with that have um, Web of Things in their core to um, not only have a connectivity to devices, because this is the one part of it, but I also said, if we have a data model like that, we can easily use this information, like what unit is it in, what, um, uh, where is it placed, in something like an application to have only one source of truth um, and to display the sensors that are maybe in the same network in a generic um, UI or even to enhance the information from, uh, yeah, from not only data, but um, yeah, the display that we want to have. And so one application that has Web of Things um, in its core is called Disigo CC. Maybe some of you know that one. It's used for automating buildings in that case and is quite widely spread out there. Um, yeah, and it uses it, as you can see also, like for the use case that I just explained, to uh, display the data in a quite generic way. And so we can build uh, also generic um, UIs based on that data model. Then something that you could have maybe heard of because it was in the media, the expo that was this year, um, uh, no, last year it started, but it ended this year. Um, there was an application for uh, controlling all of the appliances that were in the buildings on the expo. And um, yeah, this was also connected between different clouds or, or there was a connection between different cloud operations um, in order to um, get the data into one data pool. And the abstraction of the data layer there was um, the same for, um, yeah, uh, for using that abstraction. Um, yeah, then maybe one interesting thing is, uh, I think we all know that we have a climate change ongoing and we need to do something about that. And for that, we are installing solar panels, we are installing wind turbines and so on. But what about monitoring them? Are they working good or bad? Or could we do that from a remote application? And there is one solution within Siemens that is trying to do that, that is heavily relying on the web of things, um, which is like we have different installations out there that need to be connected. The data needs to be collected and then we can build the monitoring applications on top of that for like um, collecting the alarms and the data to show it in a dashboard and so on. Then uh, one maybe abstract use case that I wanted to mention here was, um, yeah, this is for me, it is coming up more and more. We have different domains. Like I said, we have production, we have uh, building, um, we have like transportation and so on. And we had one use case where there was someone setting out to build a new campus and they want to um, have a connection between their production facilities and their canteen. So they want to manage if the workers are working to like use the energy in that building and not in the other one. And so we need to know uh, to get the data from the production machines and from the ovens and so on in, in the canteen to um, yeah, manage that one. And for me, this was quite a, a nice example for we need to integrate all of the data that we have to build um, yeah, suitable applications on top of that. Okay, now I've talked only about the Siemens world. Maybe that's a bit annoying and you would say that's just another big player that's inventing a new standard and is putting it out there and everybody should use it. But that's not the case with Web of Things. Um, I said it's standardized by the W3C, um, which is um, an open consortium. I think uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, some technologies that they standardized, but that is not only the case. Um, there are also players out there that have already adopted the standard and have already placed products out in the market to use that standard. And one of them is Scheffler. Um, they are providing these roller bearings and they are already starting to 
um, have a platform where you can get all of the production data for one of the roller bearings that you just bought. And this uh, uh, API is also capable of putting out your data model as a thing description. And um, yeah, so there's another big player out there that is also using that standard in order to um, have uh, yeah, the data model shared. And now last but not least, but maybe one that leads me to the next topic is Bosch. They are heavily into open source and they have an application that's called Ditto, which is also trying to collect a lot of data um, in the cloud and abstract it. And they have an interface to create from this data models uh, thing descriptions. They are using thing models, which is another part, but that's not uh, part of the talk right now. Um, and they can expose your device that you just onboarded as a thing description. Um, yeah, why, why did I say it brings me to my next, next topic? I told you now that Web of Things is, yeah, like I would say an ecosystem that you can use in order to, um, yeah, abstract your data and to talk to different new stakeholders. The important part is if we have such an ecosystem, we can work together. And um, we have seen it in the web world that people are working together to create like open API or, or the swagger thing to create um, generators for different uh, programming languages and so on. And so we set out to do that just that and create, we created a project that's called the editor, which is, yeah, kind of comparable to the swagger editor. Um, you can all imagine that getting the syntax and the um, semantics of a thing description first is not as really annoying because you maybe need to look up what uh, keys do I need in a property, what keys do I need in the thing description. So we set out to create an editor that is like a wizard to create a new thing description. And um, yeah, we started this project together with Bosch. Um, where we are still having a good contact with these people. And right now it's an uh, open source project under the Eclipse Foundation, under the Eclipse IoT Foundation. And yeah, if you want to look in it, please do so. And if you want to contribute, I would be really happy about that. <laughs> okay, now switching topics a bit. Um, yeah, now I told you about the open source part, um, but we do not only need tools for creating thing descriptions, as I told you, we also need runtimes. And um, within Siemens, we have created our own runtime that we call Say What. And I know this is now the maybe advertisement part, but uh, yeah, I wanted to place it because I'm the product owner of it. No. <laughs> um, yeah. I told you we need a runtime, a runtime that is capable of understanding the thing descriptions and talking to it. And um, there are already implementations out there like the node what implementation, which is the reference implementation of um, the web of things. But we started a bit earlier with this implementation and uh, started to, um, yeah, put it in a source and yeah, the claim of this runtime is um, that it is industrial grade, so to say, because that's uh, quite an important factor within Siemens. Um, yeah, it is Golang based, so only 24, uh, yeah, 24 megabytes of footprint on different platforms. And so we are capable of running it on quite small devices to collect all of the um, data that is within one network. Um, which makes it quite fast and easy to use. Yeah. Um, but this was the advertisement part, so I hope this was not too long. Maybe the important part is, is the web of things still alive? Is it a working thing or is it just something that somebody printed on slides and just showed it to you? And the uh, answer is it's still alive. There is a new Carter coming up which brings some new topics. I just picked out three of them. Um, they are working, for example, with the OPC Foundation to create a binding template for OPC UA 
and to align some vocabulary of um, OPC uh, companion specs. There are also some security aspects. I learned that we have a specialist here in the audience today. <laughs> Um, for example, how to sign a thing description and how to um, yeah, prove that it's really a thing description that you want to use and nobody is inserting something. Um, then we have a system description which tries to describe uh, assets which are built up of components, uh, but not only that they are st just stitched together, but maybe more complex um, actions which build up on each other, so to say, that you can maybe if you have a production line, you have on the first step inserting the raw material, then putting something in, um, yeah, putting a lid on top and so on. Uh, and this should be described in a formal way if you already have thing descriptions. Yeah, and there's a lot more to come, um, but I don't want to go into detail here and you can find everything on GitHub and feel free to discuss with them. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know how we are in time. Okay, because I've prepared a live demo if somebody is interested. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, now we are all working with Say What again. Um, it's the runtime, so to say. And we have um, here an example, which I just want to shortly explain it. On the left side, we have some sensors that are speaking one protocol and we are inserting a thing description into say what and then on the other side i want to show you how easy it is to access this data if we have such a set data model i know um, most of you are quite into programming so um, i should have picked maybe a more programming um, example but uh, i used node red here just to showcase that it is quite easy to have an also programming abstraction on top of that um, which makes it really easy to use that data model. Okay, now switching to the editor. I think you can't see that on that screen, can you? Okay. So what we can see here now is a thing description. On the left side, we see this specified thing description. Um, I hope it's big enough. Yeah, on the left side, we see this thing description and on the right side, we see some kind of a rendered version of the thing description, which is making it maybe more human understandable to see all of that things. Uh, as I said, it's an open source project. So if you see anything that's not that pleasant, please feel free to contribute to that um, and to improve, further improve that tool. Um, but it's quite nice. Uh, or the important thing right here is, I, I told you that we have um, the opportunity to uh, not write on the left side different new things and uh, even validate if we did something wrong, um, that this is uh, not correct and so on, but we even have the possibility to do it in a wizard style. So with, what we can do is add a new property. I'm not quite sure if you can see that uh, it's on the right side of the property section and it uh, directly displays you what you have to insert to create a new data point, so to say, um, in order to uh, yeah, add it to your device description. Um, so we can right now like create a new property. We can create maybe a new description for that. And that is maybe something that's also uh, now important is we need to define the type of the property or of the data point. And in the W3C Web of Things, um, we have only some types defined, um, which are these uh, from which you can select. Um, and normally these are the base types with which you can build all of the other types that are out there, I would say, but um, I think there are some edge cases, but for the most time it works. Uh, yeah, so now we have selected a type and there is two more flags that we can choose from, which is, is it only a read-only property or is it 
even um, observable, which means uh, does the property directly tell you if something has changed or do you need to ask for it? Um, yeah, we'll say it's read only and observable. And now we have created a new property down here, which is um, yeah aligned with the syntax of the thing description. And I think it's inserted down here. And now we have a new, new data point. The problem is right now we only have the data model of the new data point. We only know its name is test property in that case. It's observable, it's read only, and it's of type number. But we don't know where to access it. And the important part right now is if we have a look at the base URL that we have up here, this base URL tells us that this device is speaking Modbus and it's reachable under the host name battery and under the port 504. And this is the important part for a uh, runtime, so to say, that can like talk to that device. And um, yeah, this, this needs this uh, information in order to know which protocol to speak, which host to speak to and which port to speak to. But now we need to specify that data point is not like if you only access that server, you don't get all the data points or not only one data point, you need to specify where to get that data point from. Um, so uh, that is right now not really visible, I would assume. Is it? <laughs> ah, here. I, I told you about that form section um, where we can specify how to access the data. Um, and there's also a plus sign because we don't want to write that JSON code or um, we want to make it uh, our life a bit easier. And there's already a point that I would like to improve is because we already selected it's read only, there should be only the read pro, um, operations available here. But I told you now we can select the operations that we can do on the data point. Um, and so since we know that we own, selected the read only pro, uh, yeah, read only flag, we know that we only um, have the read property and the observe property, which we can choose from. And now there is um, one thing that we need to add, which is uh, in Modbus, we need to know that we are reading from registers um, and we need to specify where to read from. And normally we say we want to read from register maybe 100 and we want to read from uh, four, four registers. So um, we get yeah, four regi registers and we interpret these four registers from Modbus as a number in order to have the data point test property. Okay. Now we have everything specified, but it's really basic right now. We only know it's a test property. We know it's um, uh, where to access it from, how to interpret it and so on. Um, if we have a look at maybe a more advanced example, which is for example, this active power here, we can also specify a minimum, a maximum. We can even define a constant value. Um, and because we want to set it from the outside or we say this property is not changeable, it's just a constant value. Um, and we have maybe the important part that I was scratching earlier is we can define which unit is this uh, property in. And um, this tells us quite a lot about that um, to, to make it easier to understand the data point. And then we have the same uh, specification of how to access one of these data points down here. Okay, now I will delete our test property because this won't work, but I want to save my thing description right now and I will save it to just a file, uh, maybe a more sounding name. Can I get rid of this? Can I? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, now I told you that I have say what running in the background, which is like getting all of these thing descriptions. I right now saved it to a folder where say what is like looking into it and um, is uh, having a look on the files that are in, the, in there and trying to interpret them and directly talk to the devices. Um, so we have a, uh, on the southbound side, we have the devices we want to talk to. And on the northbound side right now, say what is capable of abstracting all of these protocols that we have down there away and is offering you a REST API in order to talk or to, to fetch all of the data that you want to have. So uh, say what in that case takes the task of abstracting the protocols and um, exposing them as, yeah, I would say web usable. Um, so we have a REST API in that case, and we have a list of things that we can see in here. Um, yeah, and there is our battery. Maybe you're not believing me, but to make you believe us. I will just change here something. Save it again. Oh. And now we have the different title. So it's really a thing description we are working with. It's really a life example. <laughs> Hopefully it works. Um, and now the important part is we can access our properties that we have defined um, in the REST API directly and directly get the values that we want to have. Okay, so you've seen we also have on the northbound side a thing description, which makes it quite easy to have the same data model that we described our thing with also in our application. And that was the thing that I was said is quite a nice advantage if we want to uh, have something like that. And um, I want to show you that it is an advantage, which is by we can create abstract functions like the operations that we have in our data model in order to directly read them, write them, uh, invoke an action and so on. And for example, we have this read property here, which directly is capable of inserting the data model and is showing us what we can use from there. This is just um, yeah, like a UI for the programming that you would do maybe normally in a programming interface, but um, it, it showcases that we do not have to like search for a property or how uh, to, to create all of this boilerplate code that we need to have the content encoding because it's in the thing description. We do not know, uh, do not need to maybe change the units that we want to have. We can easily see what unit it is in and so on. And now we can just, for example, what is state of charge, uh, select that one. And the interesting thing in programming is we need to trigger and X, uh, show what we've done somewhere. Oh, which is in node red quite nice. Just connect these. And now we directly get our value directly from the device. Yeah. Which makes it really easy to use that data uh, point in, yeah, in our application and is really generic because we can just look for what things are in our REST API, um, read them and then say, we want to just read temperature values. And so we can get all of the temperature values. Okay. Now with that, okay, this is not really working. I'm at the end of my presentation. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm free. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, for this um, little bit, uh, um, it, it just has a, your talk had a little bit different perspe perspective than Riot. Riot is more on the tiny devices. So my first question would be, what's the smallest device you know of that runs Web of Things? 
you know, web of things itself, it exposes a thing description in that way. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's a smart Lambda, at least that I know of, but. Okay. Then we're on the same. Yeah. The same page. Yeah. Well, wait a second. Okay, then, then. Uh, but I mean, if you talk with these people, then. The remote people, so. Uh, we we are hello. Okay. Uh, we already have an implementation uh, for the what uh, for the TD in in Riot. It's not mainlined yet. We have to do some work on there. But I think the smallest we tested it on. So we quite tested quite often on the ESP32, but it's quite powerful. The NRF52832, uh, which is I don't know how much memory does it have and ROM. I don't know. Low biter. So more questions or comments? Yeah, we have a question only. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a uh, questions so in how does or, or are there any patches to make this cover what make devices discoverable so if you have a lot of devices um, how to find them on the network or do I have single de uh, single device and yeah if you got my question yeah yeah I got it um, that's quite a topic to be honest <laughs> uh, i would say there are two parts to that uh, question one is there are protocols that have a discovery mechanism in them for example opc ua not only supports discovering devices that are on the network but if you have an opc ua server there are even data structures on that server that you can discover um so this protocols yeah like kind of support it but there's even a work group within w3c um, so this is the second part of the answer that is uh, specifying a discovery standard, which uh, Web of Things is trying to establish in order to, yeah, not only uh, discover devices, but also to discover their capabilities in the network. So this brings uh, me to a, uh, a related question. I mean, the, to discover devices, the next thing is, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, as you stressed, you need to understand what they're doing. You want to get the semantics of it. So that means you need to sort of know about the data model. <clears throat> and as we all know, there are jillions of data models out there um, from different initiatives, companies, whatever. And there's also this initiative of the one data model. Uh, uh, did you hear about this? I mean, this is mainly, I guess, pushed also from our colleagues in Bremen, some of, some of which are here. Um, Carsten Bormann, for instance, have you seen this on the market? Is this relevant? Uh, I haven't heard of that, to be honest. So <laughs> quite hard to answer that question. Yeah. So the one data model, um, um, which uh, has become an IETF working group known as ASDF, a semantic definition format. Um, as, as being the first letters on your keyboard. Um, um, but, um, but with the goal of being a meta language between all of the different models, including the WOT, and I know there are WOT people involved in it, um, and, but it's not like you, you, you've demonstrated runnable code and ASDF is very much intended to be abstracted code that allows you to translate between all the other ones. So as the XKCD, says, you know, the, the standard to unify all the standards, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and a lot of it is more to do with not connectivity, but the meaning of the data. So as you showed the units, you know, kilowatts, zero to 100, and there's some weird stuff like some lights, you set it to 255, that actually means um, the last known value, not full on. And so there's like sometimes there's weird numbers in there that do things. And so the language tries to deal with the fact that somebody's got a, an 8-bit value that only uses 
uh, 0 to 253 of them, and another one has a 8-bit value that has, you know, different range with different numbers and somehow translate between the controllers and document it all. So um, I think there's a lot of interactions. I would invite you to check out ASDF as yeah. well. I know there's discussions back and forth. I think there's a colleague of me already involved. His name is Matthias Kovac. Yes. Yes. yes absolutely. <laughs> he is totally involved. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Then I already know that standard <laughs> or that <Yeah>. thing. <laughs> we have but, online questions. I heard. Where are they? Here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's one one question about uh, from Jaime uh, uh, from Ericsson about the link to the editor. I mean that's basically a, 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 a URL he is asking for. Yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, I can share that link in the chat or yeah, yeah. That's probably the easiest. No, it's it's okay, okay, I found it already. Um, he asks why will edit uh, also the editor uh, be more success more successful than Vorto? Water is also an Eclipse project, and it has also heavily was heavily driven by Bosch. Vorto failed as far it can be said now. Okay, that's what you wrote. Uh, okay, so yeah, as I said, we are in contact with the colleagues from Bosch, and uh, we even were in contact with the guys from Vorto. And I, as I remember it correctly, they said they want to stop Vorto because they did not have the success that they wanted to achieve with that. Um, I would say uh, Web of Things at the moment is a bit easier than Vorto, but that's my opinion. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, since it's a bit more based on web standards, uh, easier to understand for a lot of application developers that are out there. Um, so I think it's not not anyhow connected to the editor. There are even more projects than the editor out there. There is um, different editors that even try to create from the thing descriptions a model device. So to say, if you say you want to uh, yeah, create a shadow device, they are calling it off your device in order to test your connection and so on. There are different applications out there and the editor be just an example of um, there is the opportunity if we align on something like web of things we can work together more questions comments It's just a comment for, for the people uh, watching us. On the uh, W3C uh, What Working Group, there is a section uh, on the developer. There is a list of all, uh, pretty much all of available tools. So. No more things to say. Then we thank you again. Felix, uh, for this nice presentation. There is a lunch break now around the corner here, and we rejoin at two, right? <laughs>